Good morning. I am Kathy Maynard. Um, I'm Associate Dean in Ketch for External Funding Research and Partnerships. But I'm actually here today because I'm one of three co-leads for the Community Change Collaborative, or C3. C3 is an initiative out of the Office of Research. Um, it's purpose specifically to connect a university-wide network of community-engaged researchers. And so really thinking about um, being agnostic of discipline or um, field, but really thinking about the process and approach of co-creation, co-research, and really um, connecting the community with the university and the university with itself. And so with that, one of the things that we have been able to do via the Office of Research is to fund a series of some internal seed funding. And so today you're gonna to get to hear about one of those projects. Um, specifically the last two years, we focused on the theme of equitable cities. This project falls within that theme. Um, and I think you can do a much better job of introducing your team. So what I'm going to do is pass the floor over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Kathy. So hi, I'm Andelno Steinert. I teach in the history department and in the school of planning. And I'm also the director of a center which connects those two things called the Center for the City. I'll talk more about that in, uh, when I get to my slides. Um, just I'm joined here today by two of my students. So a graduate student, Elena Nakashima, um, and uh, an undergraduate, Divya Kumar. I'm going to actually um, run, run through some slides and let you know what we did with the Avondale Neighborhood History Initiative. And then I'm going to um, give each of them an opportunity to talk a little bit more about their work on the project. So um, then once we finish with that, I'm actually gonna go ahead and open up for hopefully a little discussion at the end. Um, so we can talk about some of the ideas that have come up in our work in Avondale. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and just share my screen. Oh, except I, um, Tony, you need to um, let me share my screen, please. One moment. Thank you. It should, it should be on now. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so you can um, watch some slides. If you have questions, please feel free just to jump in. I, um, because I'm sharing my screen, I can't see everyone's face. So please just unmute yourself and jump in if you wanna ask a question, that's just fine. So um, we're gonna to talk today about our work with the Avondale Neighborhood History Initiative, which as Kathy said, was generously funded by the Community Change Collaborative of the Office of Research. So we're really grateful for that funding. Um, okay, so obviously I am a historian, I work in the history department. And so I wanted to just start with a little thought, some thoughts about why history even matters. Why, you know, when, you know, life seems to be moving so quickly and there's, you know, big concerns happening, like where does history fit into those things? And so I would just say that um, history is a really important force in our lives. And whether we realize it or not, history is the thing that is orienting us in space and time. It's how we know where we are in the world. It helps us um, see our place in the, in the sort of continuum of lived experience. So when we know where we are in time, we feel rooted and grounded. Um, it lets us know that we matter, that our experience is part of this continuum, and then that gives us a real sense of belonging and value. Um, that sense of belonging then motivates really active citizenship. People are more likely to get involved in their community and their world when they feel like they matter within it. History also models for us ways that we might choose to live. We can look to people in the past and see what they have done and, and follow their, their lead. Um, it also, the counter of that is that it gives us lessons of things that we don't want to do or things that we want to avoid and kind of points out our mistakes in the past. Um, and then the other thing is that once we understand how we got here, when we can see our past through time, it actually motivates us to think about ways to create a better future. So that's really the reason that I do this work. And I'm going to dig in a little more deeply into exactly what this project involved. So Avondale is a neighborhood in Cincinnati. If there are any folks here who don't know, here's um, where it's uh, located. And I just would point out, you know, the proximity to the University of Cincinnati. So here's UC's campus, here's Burnett Woods, and then this is uh, our med school campus and the Children's Hospital campus. So you can see that it's really sort of directly snuggled in with UC. Um, Avondale has Cincinnati's largest black population. Um, 
the, these statistics, these population stats are from the 2010 census. So they're, they've changed a little bit, but in 2010, the population was about um, 12 and a half thousand, 89 percent of which was African American. The size of Avondale is 2.2 square miles, and in 2010, the median income there was 18 thousand dollars, which you can see obviously is quite low, quite a lot lower than the the national median. Um, it's situated, as I said, just east of UC's main campus, and um, our medical school campus, which opened in 1915, is right at the edge of Avondale. The Cincinnati Zoo is located within Avondale, and then we've got all these other major institutions, Children's Hospital, Shriners Burn Center, the health department, um, that are all really right at, right straddling at the edge of Avondale along Burnett and Birkenbrecher. Um, and then most recently, UC's new 1819 Innovation Hub is located in the former Sears department store, which is um, in the southern part of Avondale. So recently, UC has actually taken a step to move into Avondale, and we're in the process of taking more steps. You see, is an, I mean, sorry, Avondale is a neighborhood with a really rich history um, from initial settlement as kind of a wealthy enclave out in the country to um, like once it became connected to the city with streetcars, then um, it became a center for a professional class. It became a huge Jewish enclave. It was the largest Jewish neighborhood in Cincinnati for a long time. Um, it transitioned in the 1950s and 60s, um, first to a an integrated neighborhood and then again to a African-American neighborhood. Um, and then a lot of people know there were some pretty serious um, uprisings in Avondale in 1967 and 68. And then, as I said earlier today, it's Cincinnati's largest black neighborhood. Um, I could talk about Avondale's history for a week. So if you wanna learn more about that, feel free to ask me some questions. Um, so like I said, I work at uh, within a thing at UC called the Center for the City. And I'm gonna see if we can just go over and visit the Center for the City's website quickly. I don't know if it'll let me do this. Um, it seems to be, there we go. So um, just to give you a sense of what the Center for the City does, here are um, sort of the, the goals of the center. Um, the idea is to examine cities from a broad range of perspectives, highlight spatial components, work towards uh, environmental justice, equity, and sustainability, um, use scholarly resources to help solve problems of the city, facilitate cross-college communication between the Co Arts, College of Arts and Sciences and in DAP, um, develop academic, academic and community partnerships, just like this one, and engage community partnerships um, for the pursuit of goals of the community. Um, and then I would just point out that under our projects, we also have a page for the Avondale Neighborhood History Initiative, which if you wanna learn more, this kind of runs you through um, the things that I'm gonna be talking about in, through the rest of my presentation, what the initiative is, the archive that we created. We had um, we have an ongoing series of um, local history talks, three of which are have already occurred, and then the fourth one's coming up in May. Um, our youth core, the planning team. So you can see there just sort of a smattering of the things that um, that we do. And then I'll just take us back to the slide presentation, and we can kind of keep going. But I'm happy to answer more questions about that as well. So for this project, for this Avondale project. Um, we reached out and really built relationships with two community partners. So this was the Avondale Branch Library, and our lead there was Kaya Bergen, who's the branch manager, and then the Avondale Development Corporation, or the ADC, where we worked with April Galelli, who's the, their quality of life manager. Um, I should say that sort of the, the impetus for this project, as I kind of implied but didn't say directly, was that um, UC is now becoming a, a, a presence in Avondale. So as UC moves into Avondale, I was taking on questions and the Center for the City was taking on questions about what it means for a large institution like UC to move into an existing neighborhood and more significantly, an existing low-income Black neighborhood. And how does our presence there um, impact that place? So um, as we started to dig into that, Obviously, I come at it from the perspective of a historian, and we were looking at ways to really highlight the history of Avondale for all those reasons that I outlined earlier in the presentation. Working together with these two wonderful women, we um, started to build our project. In order, to, in order to do that, we were committed to having this be a truly community-engaged set of partnerships, and I wanted to just take a minute to talk about um, what that looks like, right? So some of these 
necessities for true community engaged partnerships don't really mesh well with the way that we work in institutions of higher learning. So for example, really good partnerships need to be long-term. And the problem is that in an institution like UC, our, we are not always able to commit to long-term projects. So take my position, for example, um, I, for the last two years, have been on one-year contracts. And so, you know, there was always this sort of uh, uncertainty about whether I would be able to consider, continue the project long-term. So that creates some anxiety, right? Um, the, the partnerships need to be trust-based. They need to be mutually beneficial so that it's not just benefiting me and UC, but it's also benefiting these community partners. And that's what, that's it, the reciprocity, reciprocity there is about that mutual benefit. Um, it needs to be based in, they need to be based in an appreciation of varied perspectives. So I am not the one with all the answers. I am working together to, to learn what this community needs and to really be a, a deep listener and to hear them. Um, another thing that sometimes doesn't work so well with universities is that these deep, long lasting partnerships are not going to fit into the timetables and the budgets that really usually run universities. So, um, you know, we work on a semester schedule, we need to have things done by deadlines, um, it, you know, funding goes away if we don't spend it, those kinds of things. And that's actually not really the best way to create a long-term trust-based partnership. So again, we've got some mismatch there that we're, we're gonna have to work through, right? These partnerships also sometimes move slowly and sometimes they're inconsistent or come in fits and starts, right? Um, and then the most important thing is that they don't, they're not extractive. So lots of times universities have the reputation that we just go into neighborhoods, we take what we need, we extract it, we write a paper about it, we publish it, we go to a conference to talk about it, and we're gone. And that we've just extracted or mined out these resources from the community, but we haven't really um, created a mutually beneficial or, reci or reciprocal relationship there. So um, that was those sort of worries or, or potential pitfalls were really on my mind as we started to create these relationships. So here's what we did. We asked our partners what they wanted, and then we worked to deliver those things. We put UC's institutional resources to work um, to nurture true community-engaged partnerships kind of based on that list that I just went through. Um, that could be UC's talent, expertise, or even material resources and funding. And those things were all necessary to build the project that we put together. Um, we really drew on our community partners for building trust, opening uh, doors for us, and helping us to recruit participants. And they were only willing to do that because we had built up trust with them. We had given them some things that they had asked for. We'd had some quick wins at the beginning. Um, and then, so this project really kicked off in the summer of 2021, and that work really catalyzed other funding. So here are the products that we created. I'm just going to show you this list first, and then I'm going to go through each one individually, and then I'll leave some time for Divya and Arena to tell you about their roles in these pieces. So we created a youth history core. We um, convened an adult um, planning team. We created a digital archive. We held scanning bees to fill that digital archive. We gave the library a series of local history binders that they requested. We, we hosted a series of local history lectures that the library asked for. Um, and we also did, we got some equipment and provided some additional funding around oral history training. And then finally, it all culminated in an NEH grant submission, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So just to run through those things. So our adult planning team was 10 adults. We, they had a wide range of experience and backgrounds. They were all connected to Avondale in some way, but coming from all different aspects, a so church leader, community leaders, um, uh, someone who'd grown up in Avondale, someone who ran an, uh, in an elder care facility. These participants were paid for their time. I'm a strong believer that you um, pay people for the things that you ask them to give you. And so part of what we use the Community Change Collaborative Grant money for was to make sure that these participants were paid for their time and expertise as we would pay any other expert working in an academic project. Um, and together we planned our ideal Avondale History Initiative. And that's what we, that's what led to our NEH grant. And that's what we really submitted to the NEH. Um, 
part of the work was to just gather contact lists. We pulled together lists of neighborhood events, institutions, churches, interested individuals. And the, the real message that we got from this adult group was that they really wanted an oral history project, that they felt like there were these elders in the community who had pieces of Avondale's history in their memories and that those people weren't gonna be around forever and that their first priority was to start working on oral history. So at the same time, we had a core of, um, of youth, of young people that were working at the public library. One of the things that the ADC really wanted as a, as a product was that we put some kids to work. And so that was easy for us to do. Um, we hosted uh, seven young people, grades eight to 10, and they met for five hours each week through the summer, about um, I think eight weeks the program was. Um, they And they worked on Avondale history. They were overseen by Divya, who's with us today, who's an undergraduate at UC. Um, she'll tell you more about exactly what they did. And um, they, but, but their core work was to research Avondale's history and to facilitate some events for the, for the larger neighborhood initiative. Um, the, other, the next thing that we did is we created this Avondale Digital Archive. So this is a crowdsourced archive that will grow over time that uh, allows people to share documents or things that they may have documenting Avondale's history that they don't, that are in their own personal collections that they don't want to give up or donate to the historical society, but that they want to share with other people. So now folks can go here. Um, this is a screenshot of what the website looks like. People can go here and they can actually add to this archive. And here's just uh, one more slide showing you the kinds of things that people have added. Different folks have uploaded photographs, newspaper articles, um, other, you know, flyers and things that they think are important to preserve the history of Avondale. So there are, I think, about almost just under 50 um, things that have been added so far and it's available to anyone online. So people can add whatever they want as time goes by and it is moderated. The Center for the City does moderate it right now. Uh, Elena does that job. So to fill that up, our youth core hosted two scanning bees where they, um, they scanned people's objects. They interviewed them about what the objects were. So they, um, they were able to start to fill up that Avondale um, neighborhood history or digital history archive. We also, the library really wanted some actual stuff on paper, an analog something to sit on the shelves of the library. So when people came in and had questions about the history of Avondale, they would be able to point them to these resources. So we created um, nine index binders of Avondale history research resources and we gave them a digital backup. So everything is re re replaceable if something gets stolen or lost or damaged. And these books are full of chapters of books and articles and other primary sources about the history of Avondale. So those are now available on the shelves of the library. Um, one of the other things that the library really asked for, originally Kaya from the library asked for, could you do a lecture on Avondale history? And I was like, mm, I don't know if one lecture will really do it. So what we did is we created a series of four lectures um, there every other month, beginning in November of 2021. Um, they have been incredibly popular. As you can see here, this is Carla Goldman from the University of Michigan, who we brought down to do the Jewish Avondale talk in January. And the room is always this full. So they're, even in COVID, people are willing to sit close to each other to learn about the history of Avondale here at the public library in their, um, their public room in the back. Um, like I said, the adults really, really were interested in creating an Avondale oral history project. And we have a librarian at the library, uh, Renee Robeson, who was willing to coordinate that project, but we need to get some training. So what we were able to do is we secured a grant from Ohio Humanities for a oral history training project. And the image here is the map activity that we did at the beginning where people are telling us where they're from. So as you can see, we brought in participants from all over Cincinnati and that's really how we were able to fund this project that it was a citywide initiative, free and open. We, um, we got participants from all kinds of small local historical societies and museums who wanted to learn more about oral history from an expert. So this was a 16 hour intensive program training with um, Doug Boyd from the Louis B. Nunn Center at the University of Kentucky, probably the regional leader in oral history. Um, we then though secured additional funds from the Hale Foundation to pay for Avondale residents to attend. So we got particular folks from Avondale who we knew were committed and interested in doing oral history and we were able to pay them for their time. And then um, we're also providing equipment to help the library and help Renee organize this Avondale oral history project. 
So the final thing that we produced was a $75,000 public humanities planning grant request that we put into the NEH um, just around the holiday time. And it was based on the dream project of our planning board. Um, so what it's gonna do is, if we get it, hopefully, is create a core of Avondale community historians. These will be folks who will research the history of Avondale using, um, oops, sorry about that. Sorry, uh, I don't know, there we go. That um, will research the history of Avondale using oral history, genealogy, archival sources, architectural survey work and other um, means and we'll, we'll train them in those things. Then they'll have a year to compile their research. And when that's over, they'll help design a three part Avondale oral history exhibition. We have three potential sites around the neighborhood. And then once we design the exhibition, we can go back to the NEH for implementation funding. So we'll find out in August whether we get that grant for the planning stages. So that's what um, my work has really been. And what I wanna do now is turn it over for a couple minutes to the two students that are here with us and let them talk about what their role was in the project and then um, how they think that this work has really impacted their learning or their scholarship or maybe any future trajectory that they might be taking. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Divya Kumar, who's a junior in a uh, history major at UC. Um, Divya, do you want me to um, stop sharing so you can, so we can see you or do you like this slide? You can stop sharing that picture. Okay. <laughs> it's Great. not terrible, but um, so like Anne said, my name is Divya Kumar. I'm a junior um, in the history department. I'm from Cincinnati. Um, I'm come from a pretty big family of UC people. Both my parents worked at UC, my sister works at UC, getting a PhD here. So I was definitely super interested in this project for the same reasons that Dr. Steinert was when she started this. Um, and my primary role was acting as the supervisor slash teacher slash mentor for those seven kids who all are from Avondale. Um, and they spent five hours a week with me over the summer for a total of eight weeks um, doing a lot of different things. They helped run those scanning bees, do um, a lot of research, a lot of learning, and a lot of just in-depth historical education that they didn't, they wouldn't necessarily experience as middle and high school students. Um, they are all currently eighth through 10th graders, most of them are ninth and 10th graders. Um, and it was really, it was a really wonderful experience. All those kids worked so hard and you could see really clearly like that first slide that we saw at the beginning of the presentation, like why does history matter? Like that was the living, breathing embodiment of why this work is so important. Um, and I think the biggest thing was that I watched these kids learn so much about a neighborhood they had lived in their entire lives and knew almost nothing about. And the things that they did know, they weren't particularly proud of. Um, one of the biggest, most impactful things that I think that I saw happen was that they didn't realize how important, for example, Avondale was in the history of the civil rights movement. Like it was a huge center and they didn't know that. And when they learned that they were really taken aback. They didn't know that the song We Shall Overcome was written by an Avondale native. I didn't know that until I started doing this work with them. Like that was huge. Um, I think as far as how it impacted me specifically, I, before working on this project, obviously like Dr. Steiner is one of my mentors. So Cincinnati history was always really important to me, but it was just, it really just proved how important it is to know your personal history as a means of going forward. Um, a lot of these kids, are very aware of the changes that are happening in their neighborhood. They have some really serious anxieties about the stability of their housing, the new developments coming in on the part of the university um, and other bigger companies, and it makes them nervous. But the history and knowledge they gained and that I gained, I think really helped them see that they have a chance to not just be, um, not just experience this, passively, but say, no, this is what I want my neighborhood to look like. And those were some of the most meaningful experiences were the conversations that we would have about like, okay, this is what it used to be like. If you could change it, what would you do? Things like that. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a little <laughs> bit so I can answer more specific questions. But yeah, it was truly one of the most 
incredible experiences and definitely affirmed like, yeah, this is why history matters. This is why research matters because you don't know what's going to happen. And it was, I was a little nervous, but it was better than anything I could have possibly expected. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Divya. And just to reiterate, you know, Divya worked incredibly hard. She was part historian, part camp counselor, part event planner. It was a really big job and she was amazing through the whole summer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elena Nakashima, who is the my graduate assistant, um, a PhD candidate um, studying basically the history of museums here in the history department at UC. And I'll let her talk a little bit about what her role has been in the project and how it's impacted her scholarship, her learning and her trajectory moving forward. Elena. Thank you. So <laughs> my name is Elena Nakashima and I am a PhD student in the history at the University of Cincinnati. And I largely study um, public history and also African-American history in the museums. And this academic year, as Dr. Stein had mentioned, I am working as a graduate assistant in public history. And my main role in this project was establishing and maintaining the Abando neighborhood um, digital archive using um, the form called Omeka S, which is a web publishing platform for institutions mainly, uh, based on interest of connecting those digital culture heritage collections with other resources in online. And I also um, assisted some events um, and a bit of secondary social research and grant writing. And in terms of impact on my um, academic work, because my concern as a researcher and interest is always um, sharing the knowledge in the process of collaborating and preserving stories and how that process can be um, yeah, collaborating also empowers the community, as Dr. Stein had mentioned. So those experiences, especially during the summer, made me think of those challenges. And for example, I participated in a monthly meeting over the summer and uh, discussed the potential preservation and also the exhibition of, of those Avando history and the legacy, and I learned that uh, um, the advantage of community-led form of discovering the preserving the history, which usually does not exist in the traditional archive, and how people want to remember the Abando, um, and also those memory attached to the places and also the person's individual life, which was, um, personally powerful and also grateful to learn. And in terms of opening the, opening up the, sorry, the digital archive to share individual stories and also memories and allow me to learn not only the skill set to make a those digital format, but also the meaning and also accessibility of the digital spaces. And so as a possibility, those digital format opens up and also disseminate those resources with broad audiences, which encourages to acknowledge and also uplift existing those um, assets, community assets. And uh, another thing is those digital format needs to concern the credit and the uh, attributions. And as Dr. Stan mentioned in her pre uh, sorry, presentations, the project should be um, trust-based and also not extracted. So concerning those credit and attribution is also the question of how to appreciate and how to respect for the, those community members who are sharing those personal stories. And which is, I think, very important part to build a trust-based relationship and also sustainable relationship. And I am grateful to learn those things during this project. Thanks so much, Elena. Just to, again, to reiterate, Elena's work was amazing. She created the entire digital archive using Omeka S from scratch. And um, it was her first time taking that on. She'd used Omeka, I think once in a class and then just mastered the whole platform. So she's been an amazing asset to the program. Um, and also, as you could hear, she has 
some really um, thoughtful reactions to the way we do history and the way we build community relationships. So it's been um, delightful to work with her as well. And I'm looking forward to keeping that work. She's going to be in this project for a long time. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to go just back to the to the slides um, because I wanted to just finish up. Let's see. There's Elena's, there's Elena's slide, which you would <laughs> um, But I wanted to end by just opening it up and I hope people will jump in and have a conversation. These are some of the questions that I think about. Oh goodness, wait a minute. These are some of the questions that I think about when I do this work. And so I wanted to just put them out there and see if these are things that people might be interested in talking about. So here are just some of the questions that I'm posing. Um, as, as UC moves for, further into Avondale, how can we best connect with the existing neighborhoods? Excuse me. What responsibilities do we have to honor and uplift longtime residents, businesses, communities, and institutions? How might we resist the urge to build the Avondale we might want? And let me just give you kind of a little example of this one. So I live at the, I live on Mitchell Avenue, kind of at the edge of Avondale. And I drive through Avondale every day to get to work. And man, would I love it if there was a drive through Starbucks in Avondale, like that nothing would make my morning happier. But that is not what the community of Avondale would want for their own space. So even though I am like, oh man, someone should put a Starbucks in here. That isn't, that isn't what that's, this neighborhood needs to be, right? So just sort of a little everyday example um, that it's, it's tempting to go in and, and say, these are the things that I want as kind of a newcomer and an outsider, right? Um, what are best practices to build long-term trust-based reciprocal partnerships that are collaborative rather than extractive? How do we do that well? Um, what are, um, how do we build an appreciation for Avondale's strengths among UC staff, students, and faculty? So we're going to have a lot of UC affiliates now in Avondale in these great buildings that we're building there. Um, and how do we really help them understand and appreciate this neighborhood? How can we shift our focus away from timelines and budgets toward relationships? As I talked about before, the way that we run institutionally on a set timeline and with a set budget doesn't really lead, doesn't lend itself to great partnerships. Um, and then finally, or then how do we kind of share leadership with folks in Avondale? And then finally, um, how can you see help celebrate and uplift this really long and rich history of Avondale? So those are kind of some things that are on my mind that um, we think about in this project that I would love to chat with you about. So I'm going to stop sharing and just kind of open that up for discussion. I think we have about 15 more minutes. Is that right, Tony? That's correct. And right. I actually, um had a question from the audience that was directed to me that is actually for you, Anne. So I can kick things off. And just as a reminder to everyone, please do um, throw your convert. If you're uncomfortable going off camera, uh, there's just throw your question in the chat and uh, I'll help moderate those for uh, Anne and her team. Okay. But also so feel question. free to okay. just unmute yourself and jump in. We'd sure. love to hear your voice. Too. Absolutely. So so here's a question for you, Anne. Um, so Erna, during her talk, talked about using Omica platform mm -hmm. and the university has access to what is called art store is that something uh, this project could consider le leveraging elena i don't know anything about art store do you nope so sh maybe someone would need to teach us about it um and you know i think though that you bring up an interesting um issue which is that as this work is really about putting the resources of the institution of uc to work in community partnerships one of the things that happens that you see is we are we are constantly getting new resources like we're constantly getting a license to this or training for that and there's so much that it's actually hard to know what are all the resources that you see even has to offer and so um it would be interesting to think about a way that um you see could create some kind of or maybe this exists and i just don't know about it sort of cross college um source book or or you know, um, like place to go to really find out what are all the resources available and what do they each have to offer, you know? Hey, Anne, this is Jennifer. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, um, Thanks for being great here. Great presentation. Your students are amazing. This was really, really enjoyable. They um, are amazing. It's true. It's such a great project. And I just, um, I wanted to just answer to the art store piece. So, if your group, your students, or you wanted to connect with Elizabeth Meyer at the DAP Library, she's the unit head of the DAP Library, yep. she can help understand uh, 
listen to what you're working on and help you understand the best resources that are freely available to you and how, how she and her staff can help you um, leverage them and use them to your advantage. Fantastic. I kind of know this, so that would be great. I will have a conversation with her. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Looks like we have another question in the chat as well um, that I'll ask from, from Ivy. Uh, with scanning bees, were all items that were digitized during these events included in the current archive? Did the scope of the archive change with these events based on personal histories being brought to scan? Um, Elena or Divya, do you guys wanna take that question? I, I have an answer, but if you have a comment, if you'd like to give, we can. I think one thing that was definitely hard was getting enough people. We had a couple of elders in the community who had a ton of stuff, which was amazing. Um, I definitely wish we could have done more of them, but obviously we were pretty limited by time. But I think almost everything that we scanned was brought in. All of the kids also brought in some of their own personal stuff, which was really cool. Um, and that opened up a pretty interesting conversation about like, what counts as history? I was like, yeah, anything that you've ever done in Avondale, like, I don't know if you won your fifth grade spelling bee, that's neighborhood history because all these kids went to like neighborhood public schools. So there's a lot of different stuff in there. That doesn't exactly answer the question, but it definitely was very personal history too, which is pretty cool. I will say that, oh, go ahead, Elena, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanna say that in terms of digitizing process, we are not automatically digitize everything in the website. We need to check in, in terms of the privacy and also contributions part. We collect the information first and make sure that those information is right. And also the person who is sharing the information um, has the right to share it. Right, yeah, so we also check those things first, then digitize the things. So in terms of, well, we published all of the things during those events, but still there's some things that we are kind of keeping in, in terms of like the backstage of those archives, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we do, we do approve everything before it goes up, you know, someone could, scan a Playboy magazine and just put it up there if we didn't uh, watch out for what we let go. Um, and also, as, as Elena said, we do wanna make sure that people actually own these objects and they have the right to share them. Um, so, but in, in, to answer that question about sort of the way that the archive was shaped by the scanning bees, um, Divya referred to a woman who was actually on our adult planning team um, who had over the years collected um, a lot of newspaper clippings about Avondale. So there are a lot of um, newspaper articles in the archive right now that are all collected by one elder who's been sort of thinking of, you know, she's sort of been her creating her own little Avondale history archive at her own house. And she was just generous enough to share a lot of it and get it out there with the archive, mostly through news clippings. So that did that's really right now the largest chunk of stuff in the archive. So she really did shape the way it is today. But, you know, we're one of the, it, this is a, a, a growth area for the project that we are, we're going to record a video about how to upload things and how to do things. And we're gonna make that available on our website. So that video will actually walk you through. If I have a photograph of myself in fifth grade, how do I get it up there just to make it even more accessible to a broad range of folks. And then people can send out the video so that we can grow the archive. I have another question in, from the audience as well. Um, how are you sharing information about the website and archive with the community? How has it been received by the community? And are there different narratives being built about the community based on who, who knows about the project? So um, we are relying on our community partners to do that. So um, ADC has a email newsletter that they send out. Um, and so they're promoting it there. We have um, Pastor Ennis Tate was on our adult planning committee and he is um, a church leader and connected to all. There's a consortium of pastors and church leaders in Avondale. So it gets disseminated through them and then um, Kaya at the public library also sort of helps to spread the word. I do think though that um, now that we're all, you know, all our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted and this project is sort of wrapped up from the summer work, um, a next 
straightforward leap would be to make some posters and do some kind of nice appealing graphics that um, attract people's attention to the project. Um, so there is definitely some promotional work still to go. I think the community members who know about the project are really like it and are very, um, and we do, so we have this um, Avondale history lecture series. We promote it at the, at the opening of every talk that we do. And like I said, we've had, we've probably seen 120 or so folks uh, come through the door for those so far. So they're all hearing about it. And in fact, we just had um, an, uh, a, a man in, who actually uh, works at UC, but who grew up in Avondale, whose parents are longtime Avondale residents. And he reached out to me and sent me a photograph of himself playing on an Avondale baseball team in the 70s. And I said, you should totally upload this to the Avondale Digital Archive. And he and he was like, oh, great, I will. And so he did. So it's those sorts of things come in all the time where people tell us that they have something and I can kind of point them to the archive. But yeah, we definitely need to do some more promotion around that for sure. And hi, Patrick. You and your students did an amazing job. So this is wonderful. And thank you for helping to make it happen. Uh, it's a pleasure to see what's happening. Um, in, you threw some provocative questions up on your last slide, of course, and you know how things go. Um, I want to flip that around a little bit because I think what you're speaking to and what you you use as an example of you see so big, you don't even know what you see is doing. I, I would also say Avondale is a very large neighborhood you can see the square miles it encompasses that we don't always know everything that's going on there or they don't know what's happening at UC. So based on, you know, rather than saying, how do we help UC understand, if you see, we don't even know everything that's going on, how would you recommend to C3, the Community Change Collaborative, who supports these types of things to, you know, factor in or how should they look at these types of engagements with any neighborhood across our city? Um, what are your lessons learned in this? And I know you you have been in Avondale and have spent a lot of time there, so you're familiar with that one, but you know, how can we learn from this project as we scale to do other types of projects and you know, knowing that Kathy Maynard is on this call, um, what would be your advice to her, to Jennifer and myself uh, as we move forward? Thanks. First of all, I'm not sure Kathy needs my advice. I think Kathy's pretty good at this. Um, but I would, my, I think the first thing is really recognizing that community relationships take time. That, you know, you didn't become best friends with your best friend overnight. You to build those kinds of strong trust-based relationships is a long process. So it involves it's and it is just much like building a really strong friendship, right? It's it's um, I I will help you when you need something. You will help me when I need something. We will work to communicate and we will work to get through the the times when maybe we misunderstand each other. We won't walk away when those things get hard. So I think it's about um, really being willing to sort of take the first step, you know, um, when the ADC and the library told us, here's what we really need. We need to put kids to work. We want some binders on the shelves. We want a lecture series. We want to create an oral history program. Um, we, we want to have, um, a digital archive. We, those were all things that we could easily produce, you know, you see had the resources to make those things happen. And then similarly, when they saw that um, we were coming in and we were actually going to pay people for their time and we were going to really listen to what people valued and had to say and re respond to those things, react to those things. I think that's how we built the trust that we did. Um, you know, and so I, I think that um, partly uh, UC is a little bit at a disadvantage because we do have a relationship sometimes in the community as not being the greatest community partner. So I think partly it's, we're gonna have to go in 
thoughtfully, listen well, be open, and and try to um, show that we are are we're in it for the long run and we're in it for the good of both institutions, right? Divya, did you want to say something? I heard you nodding. Yeah, go ahead. Or I saw you nodding. I yeah, I I think that my experience in this project is definitely like a mini example of the bigger question that you posed in the sense that um, when I came into this project, I had these seven kids who grew up in the same city as me, only a few miles away. I grew up in Amberley mostly, um, but our lives and our lived experiences could not have been more different. I went to private school for K through 12 education. My parents both have like postgraduate degrees like and so my connection to the university compared to theirs significantly different and like those kids did not trust me or like me at first for a lot of really valid reasons they were really apprehensive about like who is this person what does she want from me she's making me do work keep in mind these kids are 13 this is their first paid job so that's valid but um the biggest thing that I think made a huge difference was there were like a lot of moments where I had to just be like super I had to be really vulnerable with them and like let them ask me like all kinds of questions and they were like like one of the biggest questions that they had was that they were like why are you here like why do you want to do this with us um and explaining to them like well I go to this university, I, I'm a history person, so I love history and I love working with kids, but then also like talking about what is, uni what is the university doing and how is it affecting you guys? Like, that's why I'm here is to help continue this conversation. And it was not easy. And there was a couple of weeks in the beginning where I said to Dr. Steiner, I was like, I am nervous. Like, and obviously those are teenagers, but, um, I think the biggest thing is not coming in with some sort of agenda or savior complex or saying, here are the solutions that we have for you. And more just saying, what do you want from us as this institution with so many resources and power that can be used for good or not so good things, I think made a huge difference. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is that most of these kids never thought that they would ever get to go to college, even though they literally live right next to this university that is like for them. And so I guess that to me really showed a, ga a gap in our community engagement that kids who can see university buildings, who attend Cincinnati Public Schools, do not think that that is an attainable future for them and do not think that this is their university the same way that when I was a senior in high school and decided to go to UC, I was like, oh, this is my school, like this is my city. I think that really showed that to me. So I know that was a little bit of a tangent, but I think that as far as how to build these relationships, we are, it's not about what we want. It's, at, it's saying, how can we work together and, and change that gap? Thank you both, appreciate it. Sure, thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, I think we're almost out of time. I did have one last question in the chat that I think we could probably answer with a yes or no, just given time, um, or maybe a short response. But the question is, is, um, is a digi digitalization archiving process um, based on a national or international standard? Or is it one is are you establishing some sort of standard with the process? Elena, do you want to take that question? Sure, I guess the short answer is we uh, we embrace the, the license called Creative Commons, which basically the item in those archives are free to share and also adapt to third party uses, but only for non-commercial purposes. So yeah, the answer is we use the international national yeah um, standard, yes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, I think we nailed it just in time with about 30 seconds to spare. So um, once again, on behalf of the Office of Research, thank you so much um, for the presenters today. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. And for all the attendees, um, we still have a week full of programming. So I encourage you to check out, um, uh, stay tuned and check out our, our site for more of this impactful 
conversation. So thank you all very much. And uh, thanks have so a much great for having afternoon. us. You're welcome. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great week, everybody.